Well, hello there, you bloody twits. I'm Metal Match, your host of CC Rock, and your direct line to the world of hard rock and heavy metal in the Bay Area. On this month's show, we were lucky enough to catch up with Deep Purple bassist Roger Glover. Deep Purple came out in the British invasion in the late 60s, a pioneer of high intensity rock. Ian Gillian and friends have mesmerized millions of fans for the last 30 years. New guitarist Steve Morse, formerly of the Dixieland Dregs in Kansas, has more than capably filled the shoes of Richie Blackmore. Now, with the fresh release of Abandon, the group rekindled some of its old and new magic as they conquered America. When we return, some highlights from the band's promo tape, then an exclusive interview with rock legend Roger Glover of Deep Purple. Don't even think about touching that dial. I mean it! Scatman's World. Life's about living, laughing, loving. Drugs, baby, baby, they ain't about nothing. It's not hip to die. Drugs, they ain't about nothing. Take two. good. Purple was never just, I used to get so angry when we were described as a heavy metal band. Um, for the simple reason that heavy metal is the least musical phrase I've ever heard in my life. And without being too pompous about it, I mean, Purple has got some musical ability. The guys can play. Deep Purple playing as good as they've ever played. And I consider myself very lucky to be in this, in this, in this band. This band, I don't think, has, has ever really played safe. If we played safe, we would uh, now be a nostalgia act playing Las Vegas and making an enormous amount more money than we do. Um, it, it, that would be playing very safe. We haven't got a clue about what should be played on the radio or not. We just make the music that comes out naturally. and. Uh, that's the only thing we can do. It's our responsibility to be expressive, nothing else. The spirit of the band is very strong, stronger than the collective individuals, for sure. And I think so long as we put in just that much more than we take out, it will, um, it will be all right. Stephen Morse, absolutely at home in the band, and the band absolutely at home with Steve. In fact, what he's done is he's reinvented the guitar the role of the guitar in in Deep Purple. We've got the right guy. He's uh, he's charming. He's terribly talented. Abandon. Uh, I sat in this room last night after everyone had gone to bed and listened to the album for the first time, and I love it. I absolutely love it. It's just effortless. And it's purple without trying to be contrived or anything. You can edit this out and put little beep, beep, beeps, but there's only one definition of this album for me, and that's f rock and roll. <laughs> that's, that's what I call it. You can hear the funk, you can hear the jazz, you can hear the swing, you can hear the rock and roll, you can hear the blues, you can hear the folk music, you can hear the bluegrass, you can hear it all in there, uh, expressed in the personalities of the musicians uh, with the voice of Deep Purple, which is the all-embracing, you know, the musical voice of Deep Purple. And uh, so it's just what we do, and we're doing it still, and um, the idea is basically, as I said before, I have no ambition, and the music speaks for itself. And we are very lucky. We have got an incredible, incredible fans around the world. They are just unbelievable. So supportive. And the amazing thing is, we're getting older and they're getting younger. That's the guy. <laughs> Abandon. Strangely enough. The album's called Abandon. 
uh, abandoned in the sense of uh, just like free and without constraint. And it's just this wonderful giving yourself completely. There's no hold, no holding back. Somebody came up with the idea of a. Uh, somebody diving off the top of a building. It looks fantastic. I was fairly skeptical when I heard the idea, but this is great. Some guy diving off the top of a building into the city. And that's what I mean by abandon. I mean, reckless, carefree. There's 12 tracks on the album. And my particular favorites at the moment are songs called Don't Make Me Happy. on there it's a song called 69 which some people have misinterpreted but it is in fact about a lot of the clubs and uh, gigs we used to do in 1969 she was a very sexy song a song to make love to there's a song called almost human which is uh, inspired by the night I got stuck to the floor in my local pub the volunteer and Joe the landlord said well you better have another drink then so I stayed for a while We've done a song called Bloodsucker, which was originally on uh, Deep Purple in Rock, and we've re-recorded it. <coughs> for, only for one reason, it's because someone said I couldn't scream anymore, I just wanted to prove I could. Fingers to the Bone, I like because it's, it's another one of those oddly unusual tracks that we sometimes do, and uh, also watching the sky and the opening track, Any Fool Know That, oh, they're, they're, they're the ones that immediately zap me between the eyes. In a rock song, the most important value a word has is the sound of the word. It has to have the right texture, the right percussive value, and it has to be able to be delivered in the rhythm section just as, as part of the band. And uh, so you can sing almost anything as long as it sounds good in a rock song, but you've got to have a good title. And then the fun starts, because then you've got to have a focus, because if it's got to sound good, you've got to mean it. And if you mean it, you've got to think, well, I've got to have a focus on this somehow. So when we're writing, we always try and have, what is this song about? And even if it's um, a nebulous sort of lyric, even if it's a, um, um, an abstract or avant-garde approach to things, it's saying nothing. Even if the only in value of the lyric is just as a word exercise, r rhymes and things, whatever, we have to have a meaning. I love the fact that, that a piece of music can change for you. It can change you and it can change for you. But in the end, if the music doesn't stand alone and stand and speak for itself, then it's failed. It's a great room. It's a great environment. Steve lives about one hour away from the studio, so it's convenient. The weather's always nice there. But I go canoeing most mornings, and uh, uh, a, it's just nice, nice people. And the studio's great. It's a good room. It sounds good. It's like a rehearsal room. Um, with, uh, we get loads of gear, and it's nice. It's just, it's, it feels good. I think this will be the last one we do there. I think we're getting a bit familiar with the place. We need a new challenge now, so a couple of years we'll be keeping our eyes open. Maybe another country. I should say, actually, that it's delightful to be back with EMI, where we started. The first big success we had was on, uh, with Deep Purple in Rock um, on the Harvest label in 69, I think it was, or 70. And uh, we've all gone our own way since then, and we've had lots of adventures, but it's very exciting to be home. Um, with EMI, um, it just kind of feels right. It was a label uh, that we were with for many years originally and, and had a very happy time with them, so it's good to be back. Welcome back to CC Rock, and I have a special guest tonight on our show, Roger Glover from Deep Purple. How are you doing, Roger? 
Well, I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? Well, it's a little late at night here, and he just finished a great show at the Warfield. Amazing. I mean, these guys, you guys have been around for, what, almost 30 years now? <laughs> Has it been that long? Good heavens. How many was it? 20? 30? It must have been 30. At least 30, Actually, almost, I, it seems like. I have to say, we had a great time tonight. San Francisco treated us very well. Uh, the crowd was great. And there's nothing better than playing to a crowd that appreciates you. And that's what we had tonight. It was great. Well, I mean, on this tour, you've been playing a lot of... Uh, uh, amphitheaters and stuff, but I mean tonight you played in a smaller venue. Was it kind of special playing in a little club for a change? I mean that's not a little club, but it's it's definitely not you know the Coliseum. I like both actually. I like I like playing big places. There's always a sense of occasion in a big place because it's not really so much a gig. It's a gathering of all these people, and there's a sort of magic in the air. But a club is a whole different atmosphere. It, it's all to do with sweat and proximity and steam and you know everyone vibing together that's that's, that's a whole different ball game well you know it's amazing sitting out there in the crowd and looking around at the faces i mean there was people from all age brackets i mean you had people here tonight see dream theater you had people see emerson lincoln palmer and of course deep purple so there was a whole genre of age i mean it was amazing but you, when you guys came on stage the crowd just came alive i mean it was amazing what do you think about it age has got nothing to do with anything really i mean uh I'm 50-something now, 52, um, and I'm really glad that I'm doing what I do. And there's, there's some people, like journalists, come up and say, um, aren't you a bit old to be doing this? Don't you think you should retire? You know, like, it's, it's, it's music, you know? It's nothing to do with age. It's nothing to do with who owns the music. It's not a teenage music. It's music. It's like blues. It's like jazz. It's like classical music. It's like folk. It's a music. And anyone can play that, and anyone can have a good time. And if, you know, as long as there's people kind of come and see us, then I'm not going to do anything else because this is what I know, and I'm proud of the fact that I'm still in a band at my age. What happened with Richie? I mean, obviously he's not with the band anymore. What happened? He left. He just decided he was tired of Deep Purple? I guess so. I mean, you'd have to ask him that. He, he told us he wanted to leave and he wasn't happy and, and off he went. Yeah, the only unfortunate thing is he did it in the middle of a tour. Yeah. A la Michael Schenker. We, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it, we'd finished the Euro he said he'd finished the European tour, which he did. Um, but then we had a, uh, six dates in Japan. And... Uh, it left us actually in a bit of a quandary. We had two weeks in which to find someone. And either we didn't do the dates and we got sued big time and we'd lose a lot of money, we'd have to end up suing Richie and it would get very nasty, you know. Or we could find another guitarist that was acceptable to the promoter in Japan. And he suggested two guys. Um, obviously, a Deep Purple with an unknown guy playing guitar was maybe a bit dodgy. He said, if you come and you show with uh, Jeff Beck or with Joe Satriani, then we'll do the tour. So we called up Jeff Beck and Joe Satriani, and Jeff said, thank you very much, not my cup of tea, and Joe said, sure, I'll do it. And actually, that was a wonderful move, 
on Joe's part because uh, he enjoyed it and we enjoyed it and to suddenly be on stage without Richie and having a good time and playing the songs and in fact playing songs that we hadn't tried for years was a wonderful experience and that was it gave us the uh, it was a signpost saying that there is a future for Deep Purple. Future after Richie. Yeah. Yeah, it was very important to know that. Well, tonight's show, I think, is very evident, the fact that when Steve Morris came on stage, a lot, there's a lot of people, I'm sure, were skeptical, possibly, about this not being really Deep Purple. But when the show was over, everybody walked away, you know, feeling that, hey, Richie's a great guitarist, but Steve is better. That's my opinion. Well, there's no better or worse. I mean, I'm not going to knock Richie. Yeah. Richie was great for this band. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. He's an original. He wrote some fabulous music. Um, and he's, uh, he's a character, a real character, and I'll always respect him for that. And Steve is the same. Steve plays great. He's an original character, and I respect him for that. I don't like to say yeah, one's yeah. better than that's the other. That's true. That's true. I guess the problem is with all the energy and the flow of tonight, you know, I mean, Richie's not here. Steve is here. And yet the feeling is really a, a good feeling, which is something that I was kind of scared of coming to the show because I felt that, you know, you never know what a new guitarist would do. But you guys have pulled it off and very well. I think Steve was a perfect blend with your band. Mm. And I think that you guys got a great future with him in the band. I mean, well, we didn't want anyone. Actually, I, I told Steve this when I first met him. I said, you know, we're not looking for someone to play like Richie, be like Richie, anything like Richie, you know, just we want someone in the band who will give of himself 100% and allow us to give of ourselves and f I just want to be five people in a band, um, fed up with being four and one, because that's how it had got. And uh, Steve was great, he said, well, I'll just be whatever you want me to be, which is a pretty big boast, but he's one of these guys, I mean, he's quite brilliant, you know, he plays like a demon but he also thinks like a demon he thinks like Bach sometimes you know he writes four or five tunes at the same time in his head you know he's actually a stunning brain but more than that he's a, a humble giving nice man and that encourages us and we've all actually it's been a, a great experience for us because we've all flowered we've all grown deeper we've <laughs> excuse the pun <laughs> We've all, we're all playing better. I mean, I've, I'm seeing Pacey playing better than I've ever, fresh blood there. ever played. You know, John Lord the same, Ian Gillan the same. It's, it's just been a, a wonderful boost to the band. Well, you can see it on stage. I mean, you guys look like you're out there having fun. I mean, I saw the Perfect Strangers tour, and I thought it was a great show, but you weren't having the kind of fun that you're up there tonight having. I mean, you guys were just, you guys, you, you run at each other, and it's, hey, that was fun. You know? Well, you know, rock can be serious it can be too serious i look out see various bands and uh it's all very humorless it's all you know doom and black and dark and i don't know it sound it's all sort of fake somehow i mean i, I always thought music was fun you know rock music is an exuberant music it's not just a doomy uh, yeah you can be you can have a, a doomy song once in a while that's fine but uh the whole idea of, of having a bit of wit and a bit of humor and a bit of lightheartedness it's no bad thing, but people don't want to be th like that because it's not cool. And people want to be cool, and it's not cool to look happy, mm -hmm. you know? Well, f*** that, yeah. you know? Hey, if I'm you only live once, right? If I'm happy, I'm going to look it, you know? Oh, yeah. and it, was, it was evident in this new album especially. I mean, a band in amazing sounds. I mean, I picked it up in the store, and I thought it sounded great. But when I saw it live, it just really, it really hit home. I mean, as far as the, the beats, the melodies, just the whole all-around rhythm was amazing. Me up or help me down. Don't wanna lose those days when everything is just a haze. I'm dreaming. You spit into my empty brain. Once again, I'm almost human. Almost human. pop the CD in and blast it because there's no one else in the car and I found myself really enjoying it and almost like I'm listening to some other band and that's the first time that's happened I think it's a um, it's a result of spending a year and a half on the road with Steve um, after Perpendicular Perpendicular was the first album together and it was a great album I loved it and there's a lot I love about that album it was a, it was a wide ranging album but I think we all felt we needed to get harder and abandon is what 
that the, is the result of that unspoken feeling. It is harder and it's more focused. Well, you watch Ian on stage and I mean, he's, he must be in his 50s almost, or if not in his 50s. <laughs> Yet, he's got an amazing voice Steve, at that age. Steve's a young guy. I know, Steve's yeah. the baby, right? Yeah. But I'll tell you, for Ian's age, to pull off those notes and the speed of his singing, to keep it all in pace, it's quite amazing. I mean, isn't he a great voice? Yes, he is, yeah. But more than a voice, to me, Ian is a front man. Now, I, I don't use that term lightly. Front man says it all. I don't think I could ever feel as, as confident going on stage with anyone else because he genuinely doesn't care what people think of him. You know, he's not trying to be cool. He's not one of these cool merchants that all he's got all the, you know. He's just himself. He's a man of the earth and, and he gives out that. And he gives out that ordinariness to the crowd. And yet, he's special as well at the same time. He's, uh, when he talks about nothing, <laughs> which he does frequently, you know, people, people buy bootlegs just to hear what he said in between songs, you know, because sometimes he comes out with the weirdest shit. Um, but as a front man, he's, I think, peerless. I don't know anyone else that uh, has that confidence that he's got. Well, I'll tell you, you guys are all quite amazing up on stage there, and I think it's, it's really great to see you guys up there, and I hope you guys keep going for a long time, and all the best of luck. Well, thank you, man. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we will go on. Someone said, hey, keep it up. So, yeah, okay, we'll keep it up. Cool, thank you. There's a flow for your life. A thousand oceans I have known. Oh, the dark of two days. It's getting the skills of. Well, thanks again, Roger, for finding the time for that great interview. A really cool guy. And that interview actually happened at the meet and greet party after the show. A rarity with all the fans mingling around. But that's what makes Deep Purple the special band that they are. They're a true connection with the fans. And as some of you may have known, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer in Dream Theater also played at that concert at the Warfield. In my mind, the concert of the year. And supposedly, it was also supposed to be the concert of the year for Denise Sullivan from the Contra Costa Times. Fortunately, that review never made it to print. I guess you have to be really big these days to make it in the paper. Well, folks, that's why we do the show. Let's face it, the media out there, it, they're lost in the pop world. If you don't sell a zillion albums, then don't even bother asking the media for coverage, because it won't happen. That's how the show originated, and that's why I do it. There are too many great artists out there from the past who just aren't getting recognized for their great work. A good example would be Saxon. These guys, now they even let their fans on their tour bus. What more do you want? It's the true interaction with the fans that make a fan special. I can tell you there are many bands out there that want to give you the time of day. Even if their show does reach 900,000 viewers when you think they'd want the extra exposure. Page and Plant, a great example. Called management several times, and I got zip. In closing, keep the calls coming. It's fans like you and I who care for these guys who keep it alive. If you would like to voice your opinion about CC Rock, please give us a call at 925-933-6264 or email us at ccrock at mytvchannel.com. You can also mail us at TCI Cable of Walnut Creek, 1267 Arroyo Way, Walnut Creek, California, 
94596. Attention, CC Rock. Now, next month, we have another great show. Guess who? That's right, the rock legends, guess who? Live from the Casino San Pablo. Well, I'd like to leave you tonight with a very special photo montage from last month's artist, Dream Theater. Keep on rocking and don't stop knocking. See you next time.